1924 in Germany. But I think they've taken some precautions that probably won't happen because they've been through all that. They know exactly what will happen. And in hyperinflation, the money becomes worthless to the point where you have to have a wheelbarrow full of currency, paper currency, to buy a loaf of bread, which is normally worth 18 cents uh, at that time. So uh, they don't want to go through that again, so they're taking care of that. But the Federal Reserve has printed so much uh, of this paper fiat currency, debt money, that uh, it's overloaded the world. China and Japan have trillions of dollars of our so-called national debt, which is our currency. And uh, of course they know that when it goes, it goes. <laughs> when a currency becomes worthless, there's nothing's more worthless than a currency that becomes worthless. So uh, they're staving off the inevitable by uh, hedging and uh, doing what they can. But uh, once you buy this debt, this uh, paper dollar currency, you're stuck with it unless you can find another sucker to take it off your hands. And there's nobody right now who wants, to, who wants any part of it. So China and Japan are stuck with it. And they bought this currency to maintain trade with the United States. That's all it was for. So in effect, we're financing our our tra trade with China and tra trade with Japan by our Federal Reserve currency, which is neither federal, it's not federal, any more than the Federal Express Company is a federal company. And it has no reserves because it doesn't need any reserves because it prints its own currency. If you could print your own money, what, what do you need of reserves? You just go and warm up the printing press and uh, turn out another $10 billion. So. Uh, and fi finally, it's not a system. It's called the Federal Reserve System. It's not federal. It has no reserves. And it's not a system, but I'm the only person in the world who's ever defined it in my works as a criminal syndicate. And that's what it is. It's a criminal syndicate, just like the Mafia, which is one of its subsidiaries, and uh, the CIA and all the criminal syndicates work out of the Federal Reserve System. Because that's what a S Federal Reserve System is. A central bank is a a uh, group of bankers which ma have total control of a nation's economy. And they print their own money, print as much as they want to, and uh, it eventually becomes worthless and uh, through speculation. See, a central bank is set up for speculation. The Federal Reserve System was set up solely for speculation. And its author, Paul Warburg, who was a partner of Kunlow Company in New York, which, by the way, financed the Communist Revolution, financed the Hitler Revolution, and financed uh, the Japanese uh, entry into World War II. So I defined in my work uh, that a central bank's principal role is for war finance, because war finance is the most profitable enterprise you can get into. And so uh, if you're a banker, you're looking for the best investment you can make, which is a war. For instance, the Iraq War. Now, when they set up the Iraq War, Halliburton uh, and Company, which is the oil, oil production company, <coughs> or an oil equipment company, actually, but it finances the big um, oil explorations, and uh, they found out that uh, oil companies found out that a war is the most profitable investment you can have. During World War One, Rockefeller, uh, out of his patriotic goodwill, uh, up the price of uh, oil five times to the U.S. government. That's how we won the war. And uh, that's how he became, he was already the richest man in the world. <coughs> and uh, the richest man in the world wants to become the richest man in the universe, which is your next step, and apparently he made that. So that's what it comes. People wonder why a billionaire wants more money. Now, H. L. H. L. Hunt's <coughs> sons and four sons each one of them started off life at 21 with a billion dollars at that time. And as you can imagine, they haven't thrown it away. <laughs> so they were, on paper, they're worth about two billion apiece at the present time. But uh, who knows what their holdings are. How was the Federal Reserve set up? Well, it was set up as 12 districts. See, we had 48 states in the United States at that time. So you would think that the logical way would be to set up a Federal Reserve Bank in each state and have the 48 Federal Reserve Banks. But instead, they, they carved the United States into 12 
districts of their own, which they called uh, Federal Reserve districts. And these 12 Federal Reserve districts are actually the government of the United States. They override the states and they override the federal government. And uh, not many people know that. They don't know that this is the Federal Reserve System of the United States, uh, the Federal Reserve Districts. Why didn't the American people rise up or say something about it? They didn't say anything about it because it was a hidden conspiracy. Uh, now I'm always called a conspiratologist, and I, people say I see conspiracies everywhere. But as I told a reporter for the Dallas Morning News a couple years ago in a front-page story, I said, I've never had to, con to invent a conspiracy in my life. There are more conspiracies than I can possibly write about. So it's not a question of seeing conspiracies under every bed. It's a question of seeing conspiracies in every commercial activity and every political activity that goes on in this country. Because they always have a hidden agenda, which means that the conspirators have to keep their identities concealed. And it's always criminal in nature because they always have some criminal objective to obtain by operating this conspiracy. That makes it all persons involved in a conspiracy to, for a criminal purpose automatically become criminals, criminally liable. And that is the case of everybody who has anything to do with the Federal Reserve System. They're criminally liable for uh, participating in a cr criminal conspiracy. And there's no other definition that you can make because under law, a person who is involved in a criminal conspiracy is a criminal. And that's uh, the, the upshot of the whole thing. There's nothing more to be said. Why doesn't Congress control the money? Well, Thomas Jefferson and the writers of the Constitution specifically designated the Congress to control the money. And they designated that the um, monetary unit of the United States would be gold and silver. There is no specification anywhere in the Constitution for paper money. And what the Federal Reserve <coughs> Conspiracy of 1913 did, <coughs> it uh, made lawful a uh, paper currency which the Constitution did not authorize. But they passed it through Congress so it became public law of Congress and that made it official that uh, the, the Federal Reserve dollar became the uh, monetary unit of the United States as paper currency, which totally defied the Constitution, which provided that only uh, gold and silver could be the monetary unit of the United States, and that only Congress would control the monetary unit of the United States. So it was doubly unconstitutional at its, out at its outset, and it's become more unconstitutional every day since. Is there any gold left in Fort Knox? No one knows. I worked with a man named Edward Durrell who spent quite a fortune of his own, probably a hundred million dollars, trying to prove that there was no gold in Fort Knox. And apparently he finally I uh, was able to prove it, but they never published the fact that it's not there. And they had a number of congressmen go to uh, Fort Knox, and they led them deep into the bowels of the earth, about 50 floors down in elevators. And there they were shown uh, through iron cages they were shown some stacks of what were supposed to be gold bars. And they said, that's the gold stock of the United States. But the congressmen were not allowed to go into the, past the gold bars, uh, the gold, uh, the bars of the gold bars. And uh, they were not allowed to, I think they were, they finally extricated one gold bar and handed it to them, and they more or less could see there was gold, uh, which you cannot determine except by a chemical assay. And, uh, so a congressman was handed a gold bar, and uh, he agreed this is the entire gold stock of the United States. And that is the only uh, acknowledgement that we have gold in Fort Knox. What is the difference between a gold or silverback currency as opposed to a fiat currency? Well, fiat currency is paper currency, which is backed by paper money, which is what uh, the Federal Reserve dollar is. Uh, and I, I say in my book that Congress in 1944, during World War II, when the American people were occupied with the war and so forth, Congress in 1944 hurriedly passed a law removing the last gold and silver from the backing of the U.S. dollar. So since 1944, the uh, U.S. dollar has been a, a paper-backed money 
issued against paper bonds. It's paper on paper, a uh, paper. So that that's the st uh, status today. The, the United uh, the United States dollar is more or less the trading currency of the entire world. It's totally worthless. <laughs> it has no backing of any kind. What's wrong with paper or money? Well, you can take a Federal Reserve dollar bill and go to any store in the United States and buy a dollar's worth of goods. And so it's worth a dollar. It's accepted as a dollar. But it's accepted, credit means I believe. So that means that any merchant who accepts a, a Federal Reserve dollar says, I believe that this is a real dollar. <laughs> so that's all there is to it. It's still a piece of paper, a green paper, which is worth what any green paper is. You can figure yourself. Uh, you can take a sheet of green paper and you can clip out um, $800, uh, $100 bills. <laughs> Monopoly money is... Monopoly just, money. It's the same as uh, the game Monopoly. What's wrong with central banks? Uh, you have to understand that all the settlers who came to the, to the America, including my ancestor, William Mullins, uh, were fleeing European oppression. And this oppression was primarily uh, government officials working for private banks who were oppressing the people, charging them too much interest to usury, and... Uh, taking their homes and property because they didn't have enough cash to pay off the debt. And so people finally fed up and set sail for the United States to get away from this. So, of course, every settler who came to the United States was totally against banks because they were running away from banks. That's why they came here. So obviously they, didn't, they did not welcome the idea of setting up banks on U.S. soil. They were firmly opposed to it. And Charles Lindbergh capitalized on that sentiment of the American people when he led the fight in Congress against the Federal Reserve System in 1913. And um, his son, Charles Lindbergh, Jr., became a very famous aviator and a world figure. And his entire public career, he never mentioned the Federal Reserve, which his father gave up his political career for. So he was run out of Congress because he voted against the Federal Reserve System. Every congressman who voted against the Federal Reserve System in 1913 was run out of Congress the following year. New York banks sent in uh, somebody to run against him, and they were lavishly financed with printing press money, and uh, they put him right out of office. And there's never been since 1914 anyone in the Congress, except one or two isolated instances, We've never had anyone in Washington who would criticize the Federal Reserve System. Just as on television, you, you never have a radio program which will criticize the Federal Reserve System. Of course, you have three competing networks there who are ostensibly economic rivals and very de dedicated rivals, and they, yet they totally agree on everything like the Federal Reserve System and foreign policy and so forth. We've got to s defeat Hitler and we've got to defeat communism. We've got to defeat uh, uh, Nazism. Well, uh, if you ask the average man in the street in the 1940s if he wants to defeat communism, he says yes because his newspapers and his politicians tell him we've got to defeat communism. At the very time of the Cold War with communism, the United States taxpayer was totally financing the Soviet Union which had been insolvent since 1917 and which had been maintained by the United States uh, taxpayer ever since. And Woodrow Wilson, who was born about three blocks from where we're sitting, uh, initiated this system of financing uh, the Soviet Union in uh, 1917 when he voted, Congress voted him a special emergency war fund of $100 million dollars which at that time was the same as about a trillion dollars at that time, uh, to prosecute the war against Germany. And he took uh, $10 million of that, ten of it, uh, one-tenth of it, and sent it to Russia to help the Bolsheviks in Russia. And there were no Bolsheviks in the United States Congress, so why did the U.S. Congress authorize him to send them $10 million? Well, they've been doing it ever since. It's and only been... What is that reason?